Hello everybody and welcome to all. We are continuing with our webinar series on different topics and today we will be talking about model in intellectual property policy for engineering institution. See the, let me tell you the background. See last week actually I made a presentation on intellectual property rights. The presentation was all about intellectual property rights. What is its significance in the context of engineering education? Engineering education today has become a technical hub because of many R&D projects that the, the faculty are taking, many of the M.Tech or even B.Tech projects students are doing, there's a lot of potential of innovation and this innovation uh, may produce some occasions where an intellectual property can be created. So once an IP is created, it just must be captured. So the process of actually identifying and capturing an IP, which can be later commercialized, needs a lot of hard work from the institution. So this cannot happen in isolation. So in order to have this actually, an institution has to do a policy and then it has to be implemented. So today's presentation will give you certain guidelines regarding this, how an institution can go through the process of establishing an IPR policy and how to identify stakeholders and how to implement those process. So why is this seminar? The background is this session is actually a combination of my earlier webinar on IPR for engineering which was done last week. So what is the agenda? The agenda is this webinar will provide you a general guidelines for developing an IPR policy for an institution. This is in the context of an engineering institution, but this IPR policy is a very generic idea. It could be there for a medical hospital, it could be there for a government, it could be there for a hospital and so on and so forth. But today I am talking about in the context of an engineer. So what does this do? The purpose is it will provide some initial inputs. If your institution is planning uh, to go and develop an IPR policy, this webinar will give you initial inputs and also guidelines for developing an IPR policy for an institution. And the question you may ask like what is my qualification to do this, very simple. Actually I am a faculty who is looking up intellectual property rights division in my college. I am a faculty coordinator and very recently I helped with drafting my IPR policy for my college. So it is being submitted for a GC, Governing Council approval. So it is this background, it is this preparation has given me a context so that I can present this webinar. So who is the expected audience? For this actually I expect decision makers to be audience. Decision makers would mean management of an institution, head of the institute and dean. The reason why I want decision makers to be part of this is, see IPR is a top down approach. That means it cannot happen at the individual or an department level. A college or a management should commit for this and then this can happen. For that reason a management people could be a good audience for this. Head of the institutions because the survival of many of the institution actually become, I mean, depends on many factors. For example, your HR policy is important, your promotion policy is important, your cadre policy is important. Today there is one more addition to this, that's your intellectual property rights. Because you need to attract good people who are into research and when they come they would always look at your research policies including IPR policy. For that reason you should be there. You an institution but must participate in this. And deans are needed because deans are actually the interface between institution and other rest of the world. So normally whenever they go for a meeting or they are participating in a conference, occasionally the idea of, I mean the idea of IPR and what it does in a particular institution comes up to this. So the first audience point, I mean audience which I am interested would be decision makers. Then there are executives like me who would be looking after an IPR cell within an institution. So my role actually is to educate my people regarding IPR and also the provision that is included in our draft policy. Then finally there are stakeholders like faculty, students and researchers. The reason why stakeholders are there, faculty must be introduced because as a part of his academic career, he will be doing some kind of a research either as an MTech project or a PhD. So in that case what actually happens is, now if there is a chance of <coughs> IPR being created as part of his work, then the question of registering it for example, patenting and copywriting takes a lot of effort and uh, lot of effort and money in, involved. So for that reason, many institutions have, have instituted this policy. So a faculty, whether he is interested in his own institution or want to collaboration with other institution, first and foremost thing that he has to ask and to know is the IPR policy of that. Students and researchers must be included because <coughs> the, there is always a windfall of getting an IP which if converted can commercially benefit many people. So the audience, I told you, is decision makers, executive and stakeholders. Then I'll come back to the, when, the presentation itself. Today the content will be like this, the introduction. So I start with my presentation with a couple of slides which will introduce the context of this presentation. That is, how do you derive an IPR policy for institution? 
So any policy statement I told you is a conceptual one. So it has to start with definition. So I will come up with certain definition which will include what is intellectual property, who are involved in this, who are the stakeholders, what is their role, what are the names they view due to them and all. So once that is done, then the scope of the policy is taken care. That means how does and how depth the policy goes, who is involved in it, who is outside of it, and what is the implication for the people who are involved in this, what is the implication for the people who are not involved in this. That is comes under the scope. And in the earlier presentation, I told you that IPR is a techno, legal, and commercial thing. That means there is a technology because it's happening in engineering college. It is legal because it needs to be registered under a particular law, law, and it's a commercial because it has a commercial and a business benefit. So for this reason, legal issues concerning the state of research is must also be taken care. That means you may be a research as a student, you may be a faculty research, maybe you are running a center of excellence. Your role must be considered, and that should be put in proper place in the in the context of IPR. Then now these are the days where actually you get collaborations and sponsorship. Uh, uh, departments like DST in Central Government of India and other things, no, they sponsor a lot of research projects. Now all these projects also have a potential of generating IPR. Then how do you accommodate these external agencies who have funded these projects? What is their role? What is their contribution? What is their benefit? This must also be taken. So this is covered under external sponsorship okay, and collaboration. For example, if your university or your college is collaborating with another institute and now there is an involvement of two institutions, two IPR cells, and how do they cooperate? That's also considered. And the ownership of intellectual property. See, in a very rare case that there is one individual who create an IP, uh, intellectual property. But in a collaboration project, there are many multiple people involved, a couple of people within the same department, or a couple of people from different departments within an institute, or people from different collaborating organizations, they can come together. Then how do you place them? How do you connect them? How do you relate them? This is also a part of this policy. Then comes the question of conflict of interest. Conflict of interest is actually, suppose you are trying to promote something. Are you promoting that for the reasons that you will benefit eventually? So that's called conflict of interest. For example, if there are two research projects sponsored by two different companies and done by the same institution or the same department, if these two <coughs> collaborating agencies, if they are competitors, for example, assume that Microsoft is funding a research in your college at the same time, Google is also funding. Then how do you manage this? Because there's a conflict of interest, because they are the competitors. Then we'll also cover identification, disclosure, and commercialization. That means how do you identify, how do you spot the possibility of an IP creation? Then how do you make a disclosure? Disclosure is a process where actually you officially announce that you have made some kind of an invention or some kind of an IP discovery. Okay, recording and maintenance. I told you this since the legal process, everything if, when it goes to court and all, you need a lot of recording evidences for that recording process to be done. And one of the <coughs> factor which actually makes IP interesting is the possibility of you making money when it is commercialized. Then the question of generating revenue and distributing revenue becomes a big factor within the IPR policy. For example, unless you on front tell the researcher that in case your IP is commercialized, this is the benefit that you are going in terms of money and all, they may not be actually participating. Similarly, unless you, unless you tell the companies or organizations that if you are collaborating with us and if the that process produces some IP, this is a distribution scheme. That means we will retain from 40% of revenue and you will go 60%. This kind of a thing is needed. And you know, since it's a legal thing, there is always breaching. Some party may actually agree for something today and actually breach that one. So that is also taken care. And finally, if there is a dispute and all, it has to be taken by care by <coughs> court and all. So these are the many things that I will be covering. So let me start with introduction. So the institute recognizes the need for encouraging the practical application. So why will an engineering college will go for an IPR? Because it recognizes the significance of practical application and the economic use of the results of the research carried out at the institute for the benefit of the general public. So the assumption is that we are doing some research and this research will produce IP and this IP can be commercialized and when it is commercialized, it will have some practical application and it will also benefit the society at large at a different scale, scale it will benefit the researcher also and also the institute. In order to inculcate this kind of an ecosystem, an institution will go and adopt a policy. So what does this present policy will do? The present policy relates to the ownership, protection and commercial exploitation of the intellectual property. So it assumes that there is a chance of creation and once there is a creation, there is a big question of assigning ownership to that, that is covered by this policy. 
and then once the ownership is given then it just to be protected from other people that protection is also taken care in the commercial exploitation if and when that invention or that patent becomes commercially usable then how how do you go for the exploitation and once when you are going for exploitation how do you distribute the revenue that is what they said the document also set out the rules for institute for cooperation with industrial and business organization today you know we are living in a very connected world we you rarely find a institution which is doing some research in isolation either for the funds or for the reputation or for the technology they always go for the cooperation so this policy will also take care of this what are the terms and condition what are the kind of institution through which we should be going for collaboration what should be the limits of that cooperation this is also taken care of by this one and what is the aim the aim is very simple promote and encourage and aid scientific investigation and research so if you assure people of their i mean properties like intellectual property protected people will more and more willingly participate in this process so in order to promote and encourage the and scientific investigation that you do a kind of a scientific investigation in the process you may actually find out or make some discovery this is what the idea is provide legal certainty See, for example, unless there is a certainty in a or in a climate, people will not participate. See, many of the Western countries they say that we cannot invest in India for a simple reason that there is no certainty regarding the laws. Okay, there is no clarity regarding the laws. So this kind of a thing, if there, then people will not participate. So the IPR policy within an institution will try to establish that certainty. That means what is your role, what is your right, what is your responsibility, what is your share, all those things. and set out the procedures for the identification ownership protection and commercialization of the intellectual property that means how do we identify and for that everything there has to be a procedure it also ensures the economic benefits being distributed fair and equitable manner that means no researcher should feel that he was actually not honored well in terms of the revenue given or no party should be dis I mean, remain dissatisfied because he was not rewarded equally so this kind of a fair and equitable commercial I mean um, the sharing is also taken care in this one and as the reputation of the institute see today actually institutions are measured from different angles if you look at uh, the advertisements given by institutes like amity and all they say that our institution has applied for 200 patents or 2000 patents now what does it mean so now what it means is amity institution actually promotes ipr activities very heavily for the reason it has been active in this and for that reason many of the stakeholders within the institution actually applied for a patenting and all so this will actually enhance the reputation of that institute see many a time you see a lot of big advertisements of this institution and many other institution claiming that they have been applying for many patents this is an indication of their commitment and also the progress they have made in this ipr so let me start with certain definitions because these are very important so the first one is <coughs> commercialization so commercialization means any form of exploitation of intellectual property including assignment licensing internal exploitation within the institute and commercialization via via spin off enterprise what it means is now you have created an ip maybe it's an algorithm maybe it's a device or maybe a process and somebody will find a, a business application to that so the process of converting your ip and putting into a practice where it can business can generate revenue is called commercialization copyrighted works these are the products which are created by the intellectuals within the institution like writing a book or writing a journal that's also they can carry here okay see in order to do anything you need resources for example you need money you need infrastructure and you need support you need all this kind of a, uh, in, uh, resources okay so now since an institution is actually promoting this institution resources is a part of this whole process institution resource means any form of funds facilities or resources including equipment consumables human resources provided by the institute either directly or indirectly indirectly so the point is actually now suppose a research is being done in a center of excellence then my college has put lot of money to establish that center of excellence to buy equipments there to run them to maintain them so all this becomes a resources a institution resource for example library could also be that but library is not considered to be an integral part of this although it is a part of the institution resource that resources which are directly helps an institution man a researcher is called institution resource intellect intellectual property this definition we already know in the previous thing intellectual property is a mental I mean creation of a mind which could be in a form of an idea or it could be a form of a patent or a copyrightable item or a process and so on so forth okay intellectual property rights you know intellectual property rights is actually a 
the right given to an individual who has invented an IP. For example, if you have invented a new method of uh, producing a combustion so that it can give you more um, mileage per vehicle, then actually that can be patented. So that patent is actually your intellectual property. Then there is an important central person to all this process, is called inventor. So inventor means the researcher who has contributed to the creation of the intellectual property. That means the part of your research you have, you have produced some process which can be patented or can be commercialized, then you become an inventor. Research agreements. See research agreements, I told you, we normally involves two or three parties. There is a researcher with you working in an organization, there is a faculty who is a part of a research project and all. So research agreements are the agreements between the different parties which is involved in research. For example, a funding agency, a college, an institution or a research team and so on so forth. And who is a researcher? Researcher is also important because unless somebody is researching, he will not become an inventor, right? So persons employed by the institute, including a student employees and technical staff, they are called researchers. Students also, including who are doing a post-graduation or a PhD kind of a thing. Or any person, including visiting scientists, it is also possible that as a part of your research project, you have a funding from government and collaboration with another institute and now you as a part of this you invite some some scientist or some researcher who will contribute something he also become part of this one see many times it so happens that uh, your research ip product will be so powerful that you can build a company around that so the process of converting an ip into a business is actually called spin off okay for example google was a spin off so when stanford university was actually encouraging the students they come out with an algorithm then they started a company called google so Google is called a spin of this process. So visiting researcher is one who is not an employee, who is not a student, but he often visits as a part of this research process. Okay. So now a interaction time. So so far I have told you what is IPR and why it should be considered in an institute and why a I mean the college should have a policy and what are the components of this policy. Okay. And any questions at this point of time? Yes. Sir. Any questions, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How company can uh, able to collaborate with institutions? Okay. See, for example, I can tell from my college example. See, I'm an engineering college, and we actually we have a collaboration with a company called Robert Bosch. So what they have done is actually they have established a center of excellence in our college, which is related to some fabrication and mechanical things. So now what happens is there are some funding pro I mean projects which are given by the company in a kind of what is known as 50% invested by the college and 50% invested by the company. So now this is actually a spin I mean is a kind of a research project. So company we can participate either by, by give funding an existing lab or establishing a new lab or establishing a center of excellence within this college. Many companies like Microsoft, Robert Bosch, they do it. What type of funds are currently available to implement this program? See, okay, see, funding is a big story again, but if you are going for DST, like Department of Science and Technology, there are many project fundings are available under every heading, for example, engineering is available, pharmaceutical is available, under management science it is available. So it is only a question of actually um, like scouting for them and finding them. But there is practically no limit for this kind of a thing, but it needs a lot of a preparation and preparing a project proposal which is in tune with the trends and times of those uh, institutions and organizations. During an internship program where a student intern works as an at an industrial premises and uses industrial resources, okay. If an IP is generated by him, should the academic institution also have claim on the IP? So actually, I myself send uh, in students to internship. Okay, so this goes by company and company wise. Actually, for example, when I myself attended a sabbatical in uh, uh, Infosys about 10 years back, so before I entered, them, I made an agreement. I mean, I, I was asked to sign a document which stated, see, whatever the IP that you produce during your sabbatical here belongs to Infosys company and not to you. You may be named if at all as an inventor, but not as an owner. So something similar things would actually happen in any organization. And if you ask any of your student working in a company like IBM and all, 
see this is for if you are an employee then actually you are named as an inventor similarly uh, many of the companies which actually take my students are interns they actually laid out some regulation saying that okay if it is there is an invention or if there is a potential of invention ownership remains with the company because they have given the infrastructure but inventorship might be given to you and if there is any revenue sharing let's also discuss that depending on the potential of that person so but the summary is that that terms and conditions are mentioned in the beginning so if depending on the duration of the internship and all the significant participation is given to you. how do you promote students innovation and what kind of supports do you provide so in actually in my college what we are doing is i can tell you so for example we are recently introducing I mean, uh, instituting a, a new technology called internet of things so now actually this internet of technology works at three levels for example it works at microprocessor level it also at top level it also works about processor level i mean uh, web level and also at the microprocessor level so what we are doing actually is we are asking them to do small, smaller projects uh, including like connecting a particular device to a particular utility in house or in college or institution and all so we are trying just check that whether there is ip generated or not parallelly also many of our students who are working in this robotics and also often keep coming to us saying that there is the idea of potential I mean, potential of I mean, patenting our idea and all so this is also we are doing and we in fact have two uh, applications pending or processing on this intellectual property patents kind of please explain the process of patenting i, I think we can send him your link from last week sir. from last oh, no sir go ahead please explain the process of patenting okay see patenting process actually i will I mean, maybe i will have a session sometime later but let me tell you briefly <clears throat> so the patenting the moment some researcher says that he has idea to be patented the first thing that would happen is he will come to our ipr cell and he will declare his invention and that is called invention disclosure that means for the first time he has opened his mouth and told that and shared with us officially so once this is done then actually after looking at the potential of that my office will actually file what is known as a <coughs> preliminary application preliminary application is a process where actually you record your your invention with the right authorities so once that is done then i have to check out that whether this claimed invention is really unique and novel for that what is done is actually we have to do prior art search that means we will check the existing database of the world finding out is there any match is there any overlap so once that is done then a proper application of patenting is done so once that is done it takes long time before the patenting office will tell you so the process of actually giving you a giving you a patent is called granting of a patent so once that is done then that is open for the public debate that means the department of patenting will say that now we are planned and we have given patent to this if there is any chance that of we have given a patent which is over rules are I mean actually overlaps in existing uh, the public can raise their objections and submit so that is called opposition if you through that one then you get a patent so that means there are roughly five processes one is disclosure one is your preliminary discovery work then patenting <coughs> then patent grant opposition and final grant uh, continue sir we will continue the questions afterwards okay sir so then once the institution decides uh, that they should go for an ipr policy the first thing that they have to do is scope of the policy that means institution has many stakeholders there are faculty there are students there are hostelites and all so now as you said this policy will apply to all intellectual property created after this particular day so for example in my college so we have a gc meeting coming up next week i mean next week first week of the next month june so if the my proposed proposed policy is adopted with corrections or without correction then it will tell us the date that means from today onwards you can start so whatever that is ip is created after that date say june 5th will actually is covered under this policy that means you have to mention when the the ipr policy will come into effect then this policy also apply to all researchers that means there is no exemption 
You cannot say that researchers working in computer science department are covered by this and researchers working in mechanical department not covered. So scope will tell who is involved, what is the time frame that for that. And legal issues concerning the status of the researchers. That means the person exercising the authority or employment on behalf of the institute shall ensure that the employment contract or the other agreement types, uh, employment relations have a provision for placing researchers under the scope of this policy. What it means is, see, suppose my new policy is approved from June 5th. So suppose we are recruiting another professor or a student, or if you are admitting students next year, in this admission process itself, we will include one phrase or one column saying that I will abide by all the IPR policies of this college, whether you are a new faculty joining my college or new student joining. So this is what it is. That means once it comes into effect, every entry is actually is subjected to this restriction. Okay. And secondly, students of the institute shall be required to sign an agreement to be found bound by the policy before commencing any research activity. See, suppose <coughs> there is a new student joining next academic year. So before he starts his research, he has to go by this agreement. See, this is something similar to our HR policy or promotion policy and all. Many times we take, take, uh, take student signature that he would abide by the rules and regulation of the institute. Similarly, an IPR also included to this. And one more thing that you should notice actually the legal issues of IPR subject to country and region. That means what is true in India may not be true in the United States or may not be true in Bangladesh. So this is subject to this. In that case, for example, if there is a collaboration between India and Bangladesh or an institution in Bangladesh and America, so those additional terms and conditions should be mentioned. Students of the institute shall be required to sign an agreement. I told you this. Okay. Also look at postgraduate students enrolling for research. That means any entry, anybody is becoming an officially part of the institution must be made to sign and to abide by this agreement. Special arrangement may be made to research activities pursued by researcher employed in the institute but working in another institution as an academic visitor. <clears throat> now the answer to your earlier com uh, things come. See, for example, if somebody has go go gone as an entrepreneur or an uh, for the internship okay so now he is my mtech student but he is doing internship in another company then what happens if you find some research over there for a project that we have suggested to him so this is also covered there then there will be a kind of an agreement what happens to my college if he finds an ap what will happen to that institution where he are doing the visiting faculty and we also maintain rights and obligations that means if an ip is created what are the rights given to the inventor? What are his obligations? For example, he should not disclose that same to somebody third party at all. External sponsorship. I told you <coughs> colleges need money. For that, you will actually have external uh, sponsorship. For example, in my case, actually, Robert Bosch has invested something. In other colleges, many other companies might invest. Even companies like, I mean, uh, government department like DST might include. So this is called external sponsorship. Now this becomes a three party. You are researcher, you are institute, and the party who is actually funding. So that's also you have to take care. Employees, there may be a person who is not a researcher, an employee, for example, a, a technician in a lab. Okay, he's not actually a researcher, but he is also covered under this because it is part, he belongs to part of the institution. Ownership of the so now so far we told you that who can participate, what is the obligation for him. Now we are talking about the ownership. So the employees pursuing the research activity at the other institution. For example, now you have sent, see for example, my college might sponsor somebody to do his PhD in IIT Mumbai. Okay. Then what happens to the IP that is created? This is actually a tri-party or four-party in most and details have to be worked out depending on the condition, I mean on the situation. Non-employees. Visiting uh, researchers are required to transfer the institute to any intellectual property they create in the course of their activities. For example, there may be a six months collaboration between a researcher in Russia and my college. So what would happen? That is also be spelt out. And this not, cannot be spelt out at this point of time because it depends on the parties actually involved. Maybe that Russian institute has its own policy which will allow something which does not allow other things. Students who are not employed by the institute shall own all the intellectual property and associated IP they create in the normal course of their studies. That means who are not employed. For example, there is an MTech student who is not my employee. If he creates something, he will own it. The inventorship will go to him and ownership also go to him provided the document is done that way. Similarly, IP rights in such intellectual property to institutes considered for the use of institutional resources. For example, assume that that <coughs> MTech student is doing a project in one of my research funded lab, then that 
he is also bound by whatever the agreement that we have with that funding agency. So what you have to know from all these slides, the summary is this. If a student is there, he is obliged by the college policies, he is obliged by the funding agency policies, he is also obliged by the labs uh, established by the third party companies. But one thing is clear, all rights copyrighted works are owned by the creator regardless. For example, you produce an IP like a patent, you also produce a paper based on that. Those paper copyright belongs to the author who has written. For that, there is no institutional ownership. If the university cannot decide and not exploit intellectual property which it lists, it shall forthwith the inventor. Many a time what happens is somebody will come out with an IP intellectual patent. But institution may not be interested to pursue it because it doesn't fall into its portfolio. For example, suppose my student comes with some medical application and which we are not interested, then actually we can tell that student, say it's good that you have invented this, but we are not interested, hence you can take away your invention with you only. We are no more interested in either funding you to patent it or to exploit it further. So this is possible because all institutions will not pursue all kind of patents because they have some specialization and narrow focus. <clears throat> it is also possible that you find out some patent within your institution which will allow business to exploit without the right to sub-license. What it actually means is I can start a company, give my right of using my uh, patent to a company A, but that company itself cannot give it to somebody else. For example, I give it to company A and they give in turn give it to somebody else. So another example is for example, you can <coughs> take a house for rent but you cannot sublet it. Similarly, you can even be licensed, but it cannot be given sublicense to other person. Any transfer of rights from the institution to inventors or any other third party should be made first instance the person or department designated by the institute. See, many times what happens is we are, I have a patent which I am not in a position to exploit for a couple of reasons, but there is a third party who can actually do it, but I don't want to sell it but I want to still exploit it. In that case actually you transfer. Transferring is actually a process of giving rights to certain period or certain duration on some terms and condition. Any question at this point of time? What I have told is actually if intellectual property is created, who are the people who are concerned about that? What do they get? And how does these uh, things are actually decided? Any question? Do the students? Any questions, Sridhar? Yes, sir. Do the students get any financial supports? The students innovator complain that yes, faculty, faculty also claim as joint innovator without any contribution. How do you handle this as students find it demotivating? No, no, no. This is okay. See, this is see. There are some standard procedures and rituals. Okay. So whenever a researcher actually finds a, files a paper in university or a in conferences and all. It is a standard practice that you will add his guide name to that. But if an invention is really made, then actually the inventorship is always given to the person who has invented. But ownership remains with the institute. But normally colleges and institutions will have this kind of a terms and conditions made very clear at the time of admission only. Say for example, when Google founders were studying in Stanford University, when they invented, the professor did not take any inventorship for that, nor the ownership. The ownership remains with standard Stanford University, but inventorship remains with the students. This is again a decision to be made by the institute in cooperation with the students or in consultation with the student and faculty. And that is largely reflects the culture and the evolution of that institute. What is the validity of a patent? What is this? Sir, actually it will cost approximately 60,000 to 70,000 uh, for the entire patenting process. This is the minimum, not including any travel and all. And approximately in my college, we say that uh, we earmark about a 1 lakh rupee for each patenting application. What? What is the validity of copyright? See, copyright actually <clears throat> is there for 60 years after the death of the author. So if somebody writes a novel and if it is, uh, if the author dies, 
it is in 90, say 2015, and for next 60, that means 2075, that copyrights with him are the person who actually inherited them, his children or whatever the whom he has assigned to. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, continue, sir. Okay. So let me continue. <coughs> so I told you, since it involves money, since it will, it involves the ownership and all, there is always conflict of interest and confidentiality. Because if there is one researcher who has patented, um, patented an IP, then there is no question of confidentiality because only he knows that. But suppose a group of people are working, then what happens is making the disclosure and keeping certain things, certain, I mean, uh, confidentiality becomes a big problem. The conflict of interest, I told you, if suppose there are two companies actually funding your uh, lab or your research and both of them are competitors, then how do you maintain the balance between them? That is also important. This comes under confidentiality. The researcher's primary commitment of time and intellectual contribution as an employee of the institution should not, uh, should be the education, research and academic programs of the institute. Because, as you suppose, if a student or researcher knows that his IP will be investment will be actually exploited by a company and suppose he has some kind of a collaboration with the company outside the scope of his employment, then that is not allowed or that is not encouraged. And it is the responsibility of each researcher to ensure that there are agreements with the third parties. Third parties means the funding agency or a company or an internship for which he has gone. Do not contribute with their obligation to the institute of this policy. That means he should not go and make an agreement with a company which is offering internship which violates his agreement with the institute. That he has to take care. Research shall, okay, and this is a little legal term. What it means is whatever that is generated during that period of research. See, IP is one thing, but there is a lot of data generated in that. There are a lot of insights generated in this. All this should be maintained as a confidential thing because if you are collecting a lot of patient data as a part of your research, that data should belongs to the institution. You cannot take it on a pen drive or you cannot send it as an email attachment to you and use it later. That is not allowed. Should any doubt arise concerning the conflict because conflict of interest is a very confusing question and a confusing situation. So depending on the persons involved, no, there may be a confusion created because they may or may not be seeing in all the angles and all the direction, all the aspect of a thing. So in that case, it should go to the proper and correct authority. Researchers shall promptly report any potential existing conflict of interest to the person department designated. In case if there is a if the person suspects that there is a chance of a conflict of interest, like a benefit, um, uh, it's always go <coughs> in case of a doubt, go to the corresponding authority and say that I suspect some kind of a thing in this. Uh, kindly clarify. That's always a good policy. <clears throat> then comes the identification, disclosure and commercialization. Let me tell uh, briefly, identification is a process where somebody would spot a potential chance of creating an IP. Okay. Disclosure is that <clears throat> once that is done, then it is to be disclosed to a appropriate authority. For example, if a student comes to me and tells me informally that he has made a discovery, that is not a disclosure. Disclosure, he should come to an IPR cell or a patent office, then make the disclosure. And commercialization is a process where actually you exploit it for the commercial reasons. Identify research results within potential commercialization. That means thousands of, or at least hundreds of students will be doing their projects and all. It is not possible institution to have a process where it keeps looking at every project. So <coughs> students are normally encouraged. While you are doing your project, while you are doing your research, keep an eye open so that is there any potential of an IP, kindly let us know. Uh, responsible for the protection and commercial. That means if there is a research which is happening in my commercial computer science department, it is my job or my HOD's job to ensure that it is protected, both from the researcher himself and from the other competition. So normally, if somebody <coughs> invents something and if there is a chance that it can be patented, an application, written application should come from him saying that I want to make a disclosure and kindly give me a session within IPR cell and that will be given to him. Researchers including employees, students and visiting researchers are obliged to disclose all the intellectual property falling within the scope of the paragraph 6. That means, so what it means is it is possible that somebody will make an invention as a part of research but he will not disclose it. And once a research completes and completes his graduation and goes, then he might disclose that. That is also not allowed, at least not encouraged. 
copyrighted work shall be excluded from this disclosing. That means copyright itself is disclosure. For example, the moment you publish a paper, that itself is counted as a disclosure. It doesn't need any additional disclosure. This is all a little technical, meaning that how to go about disclosure. Inventors shall disclose all research activities and results relevant to the intellectual property. This is all question of both ethics, honesty and all. You may disclose certain things which are not that important and you, you hide some attributes which are very important. That should not also be done. See here, in case of an incomplete disclosure, the form may be sent back to the inventor requesting to additional information. See, because inventor is the best judge. So the rest of the public, rest of the research team may not be able to understand his invention that easily and just straightforwardly. In that case, if there is a confusion, if there is a lack of information that can be sent back to the person and he will actually give further information to strengthen his invention. This is also. He may be a good researcher, he may good, be, but he may not be able to identify an intellectual property right creation. So in that case of thing, it is the job of the researcher to the, go to the corresponding people and concerned people and get that clarification. Like if for everything, there is timing. So timing would mean like at what time of your invention, at what time of discovery, at what time of research you should disclose your research. So any premature disclosure may compromise the protection and commercialization of intellectual property. This is especially true in case of a patent. What patenting law says this, so if you have disclosed your invention in a research paper, then it cannot be patented. So first you apply for patent and then disclose in a paper. So that means even if you have a copyright for your publication, you, that cannot be used as a support to claim your originality in a patenting process. Because in, I mean, technically that publication itself will act against the your application. So you shouldn't be doing any premature. You should ask your people, IPR people and say, is it okay to go with publication before I do this? Or is it possible for me to patent and then go for this one? Or shall I apply for a temporary, I mean pre preliminary application and go? After the full disclosure of all relevant information, person or dependent designated by the institution shall record the intellectual property in the register. Very simple. If somebody comes for a patenting application in my college, I, after the disclosure that is recorded saying that this 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 person has disclosed this is this item and this is under the process. So these are all further details out of this which you can always read. But what it means is there is an elaborate process of identifying and commercializing that. The person or department designated by the institution shall carry out a complete evaluation. See. When a researcher finds an IP, he gets excited. He thinks that he has made a discovery, it will change the entire world. But some other people with cool head and hard head must evaluate whether it's worth going or not, worth going patenting or not. So that is done by a third party or a group or a council. The person or department by the institute shall within the reasonable time see. The thing is also promptness is also important. Suppose a student gives an idea in the month of January, you cannot hold him until June to disclose, to tell him that whether you are going for patenting or not. That has to happen very fast and any bureaucratic delays and all must be avoided. Sometimes if the patenting idea or the intellectual property idea overlaps different things like see, it may go to mechanical department domain or come to computer science department, that time also you have to have a joint committees and get things done. Commercialization is done by another party or another institution or another department within the college like the marketing department is different from production department in a business. If the institute decides to discontinue an application to withdraw it or not to maintain a granted register right, the provision for example this is a, so suppose you are running an IPR cell for many years this could happen. See you go for a patent and then you realize that there's not that worth or that is not in line with the institutional policy and all, then you may have to withdraw that. So that means you tell the researcher that no more we are going to support the maintenance of this patent. Similarly, <clears throat> you may file that you have spin off a company based on a patent and it's not profitable, then you have to stop it. All those things also to be considered under this identification. Exp 
expenses incurring in connection with the production and commercialization profit shall be borne by the intruder. For example, if a researcher does some IP invention or runway discovery, the application cost, the process cost, all to be taken care by the intruder. So interaction time. Any question? Any question, sir? Uh, no questions, sir. Right, sir. Okay. okay. So last final two things is actually recording of the maintenance. For example, I told you <coughs> this involves a lot many activities which must be recorded because institutions are permanent, people are not permanent. So if there is an IPR man who is in charge, if he transfers and then case actually to final a case or to decide something, we need a records. So this needs to be maintained. There has to be a separate department within or a separate head within the IPR cell to do this shall maintain accounting recordings each intellectual property that means who is the student to apply for IP, what was the cost incurred on that, what is the maintenance cost which we have to give, all those things are taken. And the next important thing is distribution of revenues. In case commercial agents happen and start generating money, what needs to be done? So for that actually, this is what is done. So suppose there is an invention which start generating money, then there is a net income. Assume that it makes about 100 rupees, then agreed, as previously agreed, about 7% will go to inventor, about 25% go to department, about 70% go to the institute. This is assuming that inventor belongs to college, department, he works in the department and he is working in the institute. But again, if there is a funding agency, then this distribution will differ. This is what it is. In case where there is more than one inventor, then there is a prime inventor, then there is a secondary inventor. Okay. And then you have to work on revenue distribution. So what it means like it is like in business. So depending on the stakes that you take, depending on the investment that you make, the kind of the contribution that you have made, your distribution, your revenues will change. Similarly in invention process, depending on the contribution that you have made in the creation of that one and the participation or support given by the institution and all, there is a distribution pattern which go, goes case by case. In case of establishing a spin-off enterprise, that means suppose somebody starts a business on an IP, then there's a different structure because now it's one start generating, I mean generating business, it goes by day by day, year and half year, every year it will generate money, then whatever the duration that is to be taken care. In case of exploitation of trademarks and other things, this is secondary. So suppose the spin-off company is actually become so successful that the trademark itself is becomes a valuable thing, then that is to be taken care. And next to important is breach of the rules of this policy. See, we all know that in whenever you are running an institution, there are occasions where somebody will break a law, somebody will break a rule. Okay, in that case, it is called a breaching of a law. That means you agree to do something, you do not do that. So you agree to um, honor certain things, and you did not honor that. So that kind of a thing is called breach. For that, this is the policy. Breach of the provisions of this policy shall be dealt with under the normal procedures of the institute. That means there will be a committee which will address these issues and that is a very sophisticated process. And many a times if you are not able to settle the issues within yourself, within the institution, then that becomes a dispute and appeals. Then it goes to court and courts will decide. And I told in the previous thing, there are courts at state level, national level and world level. Okay, once this is agreed, like in any institution, uh, there will be a top body which will actually take care of this and they would answer these questions and finally frame it. Once everything is settled, that means every department agrees for this provisions of the IPR policy, every sponsoring are uh, ready to do that, then this will come into effect. For example, this policy shall come into effect on date. For example, from 5th June, maybe uh, if the governing council agrees to uh, for the provision that we have submitted, draft we have submitted, that will come into effect. So the conclusions, the provisions of this model intellectual property are based on the existing intellectual property policies of several universities and institutes. See, universities also the R&D institute today, engineering college also institute, medical college also institute. So the thing that we are given is a model. Model means it actually, it gives you a very general case. But this can be customized to your institute the way you want it. For example, if your college is not taking any sponsorship, then that element won't be there. If you are not going for a collaboration, that element won't be there. Maybe if you have a multilateral, multi-party 
collaboration, then you have to add additional element. So this to be taken care. So the whole idea of this project when I mean, the presentation was to say that there exists a model which can be customized to your requirement. So when you are developing, this can be used as a base document and you can use it for whatever the application that you want. So any question at this point in time because I have almost concluded my presentation. Uh, what is the difference between assigning and inter inventor? Assigning? If assigning. So assigning, okay. That's what, see, as you are still inventor, see for example, inventor is the person who has done this. But the inventor himself may assign it to institution. For example, he says, I want to remain as an inventor, but ownership I will give it to somebody else. Say for example, an institution or a company and all. So that is called assignee. Assignment, you know, is a process of giving something uh, something to somebody. Okay. So normally if you are working for a, a company, then assignee is the company. Owner is a company and actually uh, uh, the inventor is a. See, another meaning of assignee is also, see, suppose you want to exploit your patent, then you can transfer the ownership of your patent as an assignment to somebody. That means you can say that I am giving my patent for commercial exploitation for one year. So during that one year period, he becomes assigned. Hello, Sridhar. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, suggest some format discourse. Format for what? Discourse. Oh, disclosures. You mean disclosures? Uh, I hope uh, he can clarify. We will. Yes, sir. He is saying disclosures. Ah, see, disclosure is a process. Okay, disclosure is a very simple procedure. What happens is, I will sit in front of the inventor and he says, this is what I have done. So whatever orally he tells, we will record that. Okay, and normally the process like looks like this. So there is an inventor sitting in front of you and there is a person sitting opposite to him and he says like, what is your invention? So that's the first question they ask. He says, this is my invention. So then the question comes like, why did you invent this? Then the answer would come. Then how do you, do you think that there is other devices or inventions which actually solve the same problem? If he says yes or no, depending on that, then we will take it further. Okay. So this all is recorded in a single I mean, uh, plain paper and that is disclosed. If you want a sample, I can send you. It's available on the net also, but I can send you if you shoot me an email. What is required to have IPR office at an engineering college? Uh, yes, uh, okay. So <clears throat> there is a physical setup that you ought to do and other things. Maybe I will make a presentation on I mean, the webinar or sometime later. But all that you need to actually, you should, uh, college should designate somebody as uh, IPR in charge or like a faculty in charge. And he has to go some kind of a training of our two days or three days where actually some, uh, he will get the basic knowledge of how to set up a uh, IPR cell. Maybe, maybe in a week's time or next week, I will make a presentation on how I went about actually setting up an IPR cell in my college. What is the period of a patent? Certain years or a whole lifetime? No, no, no. Patent is for 20 years. Patent, any patent is given for 20 years. Say, for example, the original Google patent was actually patented in 1998. So that will expire in 2018. What is the cost involved? I told you, no, sir. Actually, uh, any patenting cost will cost you anything between sixty thousand to one lakh, depending on your location. For example, if you're in a city like Metro and all, then there's no travel cost and all. But if you're in a place like Dharwad and all, then we have to move between Pune or Mumbai to get it done. So approximately six minimum is sixty, max is one lakh. Yes, sir, those were all the questions. Ah, one more question is there, sir. What are the necessary forms one should fill up to submit a patent and how much information shall be disclosed initially? 
See, I told you, you know, if you are submitting a preliminary, you just say your invention and its uh, significance. You don't tell the further details. But in a, so that would, that is also, there is a government form for that, which will cost you a few hundreds. And also there is a consultative charges from the attorney who will tell you what to put and what not to put because it's a legal commercial, legal commercial matter. So then we have to up, up, apply, I mean, apply your proper patent application. And then that's a big, very big form, which includes every detail like, how is your thing is different? What is the novelty about this? How do you know that this is not already invented? Those things are there. That will also cost a few hundred from government perspective, but a few thousand from the consultancy perspective. So there are maximum four or five forms which will go about this. Hey, sir. Those are all the questions. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much for Sridhar and also all the audience. So in case there are any questions, actually you can always send it to them here. So these are the, some references which I have used for this. And uh, this is my 